Good evening and welcome to this Fatback 4 daily special um, pod that we're doing. We're delighted to be joined by Matt Herman from the Talking Foosball podcast. Matt, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for asking me. No, no, no problem at all. Our pleasure. Um, for anyone that doesn't know the Talking Foosball podcast, I think it's excellent. I've been listening to it for a while now and it, it's a great source of uh, information for all things Bundesliga. So anyone that's not subscribed, get on it. Very, very interesting stuff um, with the lads on there. Um, Matt, we just wanted to have a quick chat because, all right, we're a Liverpool podcast and the the toys between Liverpool and Germany are quite obvious and sure. the links between Liverpool and Bundesliga players is, is quite obvious. Some, are, are, some have legs and some maybe not so much. So um, tonight we're just going to have a quick chat about some of the rumours that have been coming out, what you think of it, what the the media in Germany maybe make of some of these and you know if they have legs or if they don't and we're also going to talk about the big one the fact that football is starting back in the Bundesliga this weekend and we'll get your take on that and uh, your opinions I believe you're a Hertha Berlin fan is that correct oh yes oh yes oh big yes <laughs> so we get your opinion on Hertha and and their ploy for the rest of the season as well. So Matt, if you just want to give us a little bit about yourself and and use our own pod there, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I am a, a journalist who covered the Bundesliga mostly for uh, German international broadcaster Deutsche Welle uh, for about ten, twelve years. Um, I have recently moved back to the United States, where I'm now a, a university lecturer in you know sports journalism, sports marketing, communications, that sort of thing. But the whole time I've been doing uh, the Talking Foosball podcast, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going strong. We're still watching as much Bundesliga as possible, and thank goodness this weekend uh, we can start back up again. <laughs> and how do you find following it from the across the pond? Um, what's the timing for the matches? Is it difficult, or does it fit in with the time zones? It's not too bad. It's not too bad. I mean, uh Depending on what time of year you're watching, sometimes they'll start as early as uh, 8.30 on a Saturday yeah. morning. But, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the young man I once was, so 8.30 <laughs> for me is no problem. <laughs> That's it. These are the sacrifices we have to make. Um, so, yeah, the big one, Matt, the football starting back this weekend. Um, I know everybody is is quite hungry for some football, for some live sport of any type. Um, and I know from listening to yourselves on your own pod that you guys do have reservations that may, may be a bit too soon to come back. Um, would you, would that be correct? And what would you say is your take on it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that um, I don't have any insider information. I don't have any, you know, like sort of scientific or medical uh, insight to offer other than it seems to me that within the last few weeks, which is to say, I don't know, I'd say the last 10 to 14 days, there have been two or three clubs that have had positive tests of players and or, you know, uh, physio staff or what have you. So it seems to me that despite the fact that Germany has its outbreak under control a lot better than a lot of countries, yeah, you know it hasn't gone away. <laughs> and the chances that we're going to get further positive tests, um, over the next, you know, month and a half that they're looking to complete this Bundesliga season, I think the chances are pretty decent. And and weathering that storm is is going to pose a lot of questions to the people running the Bundesliga. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you never know whether they're really going to be up to it. Well, this is it. And I mean, it, it's a great test for, for the rest of Europe looking on. I know... Um, yeah, the the well documented um, German handling of the coronavirus outbreak, you know, it's it's been, it's got nothing but sort of positive press compared to some of the other countries in Europe that have suffered. So I think you know, if there's one country that's going to to be the the flag bearer as such for starting up again, all eyes will be on will be on the Bundesliga. Um, from. A health and safety point of view, I mean, I know you've mentioned clubs. I've heard of Cologne and Dynamo Dresden have have had players. What other clubs have sort of been impacted? Have you heard of any other Bundesliga clubs? Or Well, toward the beginning of the outbreak, I know that there were players at uh, Hanover 96 and one at uh, Hertha. Yeah. Uh, I believe one or two other top flight clubs, but it's it's been pretty widespread and, yeah. and it's, it's clear that um, 
I don't know, the, the idea is that they want to have uh, enough flexibility to, to finish the season, um, even if you do get small scale um, um, positive tests yeah. within teams, they're, they're, they're encouraging uh, coaches to take in, you know, perhaps more um, youngsters than they would have there. I mean, a lot of these teams have been going into these quarantines ahead of the first set of games with, you know, 30 players, yeah. which is a, certainly a lot more than they would typically do for, for a, a pre, you know, mm. pregame cor- uh, pre sort of trip of, of any type otherwise. Indeed. Yeah, no, and that that's that's it. It's um I suppose how you manage your way through this, it'll be very interesting from a, a Premier League point of view, certainly. Um as as Liverpool fans, we're we're sort of sitting back and have the, the feet up and the cigars at the ready, you know, because it's um it's probably the one league in Europe that's you know, for a champion it it's pretty much out of sight. It's it's the other positions, relegation, European places that are really up for grabs. The Bundesliga is not so um it's not so uh, co- uh it's not as closed off Bayern Munich don't have a substantial lead there's no clear runaway leader is that does that play into it the the fact that, that they need to get it back up and running and try and get it played out as quickly as possible is that is that good feeling that it will be completed to the yeah. season's end definitely oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, hmm, the sporting considerations, the competitive considerations about, you know, who's who's going to take the title, qualify yeah. for Europe, uh, you know, beat the drop, what have you. I think those considerations probably played very little role <laughs> in restarting, to be honest. I think it was pretty much all about the money. Um, and, and, you know, to be fair, the, 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 the clubs near the top, which tend to be the richer clubs, you know, your, your yeah. Bayern, Dortmund, Leipzig, you know, maybe uh, Leverkusen, Wolfsburg, teams that have either corporate money or, you know, just a big enough turnover yeah. that they don't, they weren't particularly worried about, um, you know, completing the season and getting their last tranche of, of TV money. But a lot of those mid table and lower um, uh, table clubs who are really pretty dependent both on TV money and, you know, gate money i mean everybody's losing their gate money but you know yeah. for some of those from some of those teams losing both the gate and the tv money would have meant you know insolvency uh before yeah. too too long so really getting the season started up again was all about keeping clubs financially whole or, or as whole as, as they could possibly be um and there's there's sort of uh, you know, not everyone's saying from the same hymn sheet at the moment yeah. about what to do if things do go wrong. Um, there was an emergency meeting, um, or there there will be an emergency meeting, a series of meetings. Um, the Bundesliga uh, is definitely not all in agreement of what they will do if they have to abandon the season at some stage, whether that is because, you know, a number of teams have outbreaks or because the government tells them they have to stop again, which could happen and you know, the Bundesliga clubs have promised that they will follow government directives in, in mm-hmm. this area. Um, you know, the teams, unsurprisingly, <laughs> at the bottom of the table who would be automatically relegated were the table to be frozen in place from today uh, are not really on board with the idea it's that they would be us. sent down. They want to yeah. have the chance to, you know, uh, work their way out of trouble. Yeah. But I have a feeling that if that were to happen, they probably would get automatically relegated and and you know maybe there would be some kind of financial compensation um considered uh probably wouldn't <laughs> equal the money they lose from yeah. from from dropping but you know I, I think a solution would have to be found if there was no way to play again yeah it's actually a, it's an opinion i do share myself from a premier league point of view i think there could be a situation where they're going to restart the games they're going to try and get them played and if they can't get it to completion they will just go away a points per game finish the season as is where i don't know if you've been following it there's a bit of a breakaway the bottom six clubs in england are are trying to get leagues the side that they're objecting to every sort of um suggestion that's being put forward they want to be played don't want to be at neutral venues they want relegation to be scrapped they want um everything but it seems like they're just Obviously, uh, clubs are looking after their own situation, which is which is only fair. It's only right. It's a business at the end of the day. Whether our fans like to think of it as that way or not, it, it's the way it is. And they they could 
have that sort of blow softened by a bit of a financial not windfall because I don't think the money is going to be there in any way, you know, especially Premier League. I, the money in the Premier League is ridiculous, even for finishing like 16th, 17th is, is quite substantial yeah. compared to other countries, even the Bundesliga. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it, it's quite um, outrageous, really, the money involved in the Premier League. So I think oh, we yeah. might have to come to some... some I mean, like Bournemouth that. makes more TV money than Bayern Munich does. Yeah, you know, it's outrageous. <laughs> you know, it's absolutely outrageous when you think of it. When you put it into that context, you know, Bayern Munich are, what, one of the top three or four clubs in the world fan fan wise reputation and they get earn less than Bournemouth. So it really is a stark sort of reminder of the money that that we're dealing with here. And ultimately I do think it will play a huge part in how this all plays out, you know. So Matt, if we can move on very quickly, a lot of Liverpool fans have one name in their in their minds at the moment and it's a signing that's been touted for a long time and it's that of Timo Werner to Anfield. Now Nobody knows the current situation. You hear reports one day that it's being agreed. You hear reports the next day that it's not being agreed. We don't know. We, we haven't got a clue what's going on. Um, Timo Werner, from, from my side, looks like a player who would suit Liverpool style well, but that's from watching him maybe not as regular as yourself. How would you feel that the likes of a Timo Werner would suit a club Liverpool team? Well, I, I, I suppose we're probably... Um two sides of the same coin. I'm on the other side, which is to say, I, I watch him. I watch a lot of Timo Werner. Uh, I yeah. watch a lot of Bundesliga, but I don't yeah. watch as much Liverpool. I mean, I yeah. see them in Europe. I see an occasional uh, Premier League game. Um, but I, I think he's a spectacular player, and I think he would be a really great addition to most teams. I mean, there would be maybe a team who plays an extreme possession style that would not necessarily suit his yeah. his strengths. He does like to operate in a bit of space. Um, he is not necessarily the very best passer of the ball or the best controller of the ball in, in a one-touch situation. But he is, in almost every other way, uh, a, a, a great attacker. I mean, he's someone who is a, is a supreme finisher. He is extremely quick. Um, his positional... Um, plays is very good um i think that he would fit really well into liverpool and yeah. i think it, i think it's a move he wants I, it seems to me that he was burned um last summer because there was a lot of smoke about him moving on from from leipzig to bayern munich uh, yeah. bayern munich eventually sort of thumbed their nose at him uh he seemed to be a bit hurt by that and now you know the only move that would make sense for him within germany would be to bayern and to me, it's got to be either the Premier League, probably Liverpool, or you know, a club like Real Madrid or something like that. So, I think that he would fit hand in glove at Liverpool. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. Like from what I've seen of him, I, I agree with you. He's such a, a a quick player. He's he's a direct player as well. He seems to fit the club heavy metal style of football, for want of a better phrase, and. I just feel myself that he does have the tools. Now, I've heard a comparison, and you know more about this than me. Someone has said he could be another Andre Schorle, that he was a big player in Germany and came and struggled in Italy, now uh, in, in England. Now, I don't see that myself. You know, I think he's a totally different type of player. But is there any fear that if Liverpool were to sign him, that we would be getting another Andre Schorle? Uh No, no, I, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> Andre Schorle to be fair. Uh, he, he was a fine Bundesliga player, yeah. but he was never a player who came to, to mind among, you know, Bundesliga watchers as like a, you know, top five player in the league or something like that. I mean, he might've been one at his best been a top 10 player, but even that would have been pushing it. Whereas, you know, Timo Werner for most of us, you know, you, there are not five better players than him in the Bundesliga. And when you think about just pure strikers, there's probably there's probably only one. I mean, unless you want to count Holland, but maybe he hasn't you know proved quite enough to yeah. to, to earn that. Um, you know, Andre Schürrle. One of the things that was always um, he was known for, which you know is generally a good thing, is he takes a lot of shots. Um, which you know Timo Werner likes to take a lot of shots as well. <laughs> Fortunately for him, his shots are a lot better quality than than it's mostly Andre Schürrle's ever will. Although the one. Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, the one head scratching thing I have though is is looking at the struggles that um, 
you know, Nabi Keita has had since joining yeah. Liverpool. I mean, I think that most Liverpool fans have learned to appreciate him a little bit more than they did at the start when he really, really struggled. Yeah. He seems to have found his place to a degree. Um, but all of us who watched his last season in the Bundesliga thought that he was just going to walk in and, you know, be a supernova, which really didn't happen. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I guess you can't happen. take it for granted. Yeah, exactly. And it's actually an excellent comparison. You know, uh, my own take on Nabi Koita is he's an excellent player, but he just seemed to have struggled physically since he's come to the Premier League in the sense he's picking up so many knocks. You know, he's, he's getting injured in warm ups and he's, he's going off with innocuous. And, the innocuous challenges, you know, and, and that's the frustrating thing. I think when he's on the ball and he's playing, he looks good and a lot of fans, he's, he splits the fan base at Liverpool like no player that I've seen in a long, long time. You know, there's some that think he's the second coming and others that are not so sure. I fall firmly in the middle. I'm, I do like him. But it's an excellent comparison. He's come from Leipzig. Timo Werner will come from Leipzig and if anything, it might. I, I think don't think Nabi Kite has learned English yet. To be honest, like, and he's there a couple of years, you know. So that that's a bit of, a, and he'd signed for a year before that as well. So it's a bit of an unusual, um, an unusual thing to do. But I think maybe if Team Overner was coming, and look, it's assuming Team Overner is to come in. It might not happen, but I'm working on the assumption that he does. Uh, it, it might be good. It might be something to help Kate along, and it might be something to help Werner that Kate is there because I think they did link up quite well when when he was at Leipzig. Now I know when Werner and Kate would have been together at Leipzig, Werner wasn't the most prolific at that stage, and it's probably his progression seems to have been gradual year on year, uh, even from when he was at Stuttgart. But I think he was more—he was more of a winger when he would have started. Now was he? And then he's gradually moved central, and it's probably only th this season that he's been maybe central. Is it? Would that be right, or am I? No, I, I would say that I would say that um, he's been basically their their central attacking um, threat for the last couple of seasons. But mm. you know, he is somebody who who I think his his positional sense has changed. He used to like to drift out wide even when he was he was um you know initially set up centrally i think he has learned that the best place for him to be the most dangerous place for him to be is central and yeah. you know unless it, it serves a real purpose he's gonna try to stay home um because that's you know that's where the goals are that's where the glory is <laughs> yeah and that that's again it's not a bad habit for the center forward you know want the score we've we've actually We've got Roberto Firmino, who you'd be familiar with from this Hoffenheim days, but the, the role that he's playing now was probably totally different. You know, he would have been, what, an attacking midfielder maybe in the Bundesliga. And then he comes to England, he's put out wide, didn't really suit it, and then Klopp has just transformed him into this number nine, but he's not the most prolific number nine in the world. And it's one position in the team I think that Liverpool could do with maybe a bit of a boost. Not to say that Werner would replace Roberto Firmino, but I think it might change the way Liverpool even play and set up because it would offer them another dimension. Now, look, I, I don't want to be in the fantasy football realms talking about a player that Liverpool may never sign. So let's talk about more players that Liverpool may never sign, that <laughs> Liverpool will never sign, in my opinion. they get We get linked to a lot of players from the Bundesliga. Now, I'll throw a few names at you and on a scale of one to 10, where one is not going to happen and 10 is probably not going to happen. How likely is Koi Havertz to go anywhere other than Bayern Munich? Like are Liverpool oh. in any chance to get Koi Havertz? <laughs> no, wait, wait, is is 10 more likely to, to go somewhere? More likely than... than one, but it's it's not going to be Liverpool. <laughs> oh yeah, Kai Havertz. Kai Havertz is going to be a Bayern player. Uh, it, it, yeah. it may happen next season. It may happen the season after that. Probably next season. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the place that really suits him. That suits his strength. I think um, not only is he someone who has you know less of that sort of heavy metal football tendency to him. He's he has a certain languid uh, yeah. quality to his play. Um, but he's also somebody who's going to be central to um, the German national team for. Yeah quite some time to come. And, and Bayern makes it their business to, to sign as many of those players as they can. I mean, every once in a while you get a guy who, who you know, who gets away from them. You know, look at somebody like Mesut Ozil who never played for Bayern, yeah. despite being a big-time Germany player. But most guys who are, you know, yeah. mainstays for Germany, they, they, they make they their make way to Bayern way at some point. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and there's actually a good comparison. Ozil would be a, 
in my opinion, Havertz is a similar type of player. He, he's physically quite like him as well. Yeah. They're both quite big. I mean, Ozil gets a lot of um, a lot of criticism over in the Premier League for his his languid style. Um, yeah. I personally, I think he's a wonderful player. To be honest, oh yeah, I just think he, he doesn't run back huffing and puffing that a lot of um, the English uh, fans would like to see, but. He's a spectacular player, and he's the closest yeah. to, to Havertz. If someone ever says to me, well, you've never seen Havertz, but what's Havertz? And I'd say, well, he's, he's, he's similar to, to Ozil. He's the same sort of type of player as that. And I, I agree. I think it's Bayern all the way for him. And, yeah, yeah maybe next season, another year at, at Leverkusen. And then, yeah, and Havertz, and then Havertz wants to be like Ozil. Ozil yeah. was his the guy when he was coming up that he he really looked to to, yeah. to pattern his game after. And speaking on the that Ozil point, when when I hear somebody who doesn't like Ozil or doesn't take him seriously, that is a signal to me to not take them seriously. <laughs> it is. It, it's such a lazy, um, a lazy criticism, you know. And and the amount of it, like we we obviously follow the English media and the English coverage of the Premier League, and the amount of abuse that Meza Ozil gets, it's it's scandalous, you know. And yeah. you know, I've seen him against Liverpool tear us apart, and. You'll get you'll get lashed over because he's not tracking back a runner, you know, or he's handing off a runner, and you know, it's just ridiculous. You know, you players have strengths and praise the strengths. Don't focus on the weakness all the time. But I think Havertz could be the new Ozil, and for his own sake, I hope he doesn't come to the Premier League because they're an unforgiving bunch over there. Another player that's more used to English systems would be Jaden Sancho. Now, a lot of this Liverpool were linked with Sancho on and off for a while, but it's been very tenuous. But I've seen stronger links to Manchester United yeah. to the extent now that they're saying Man United might park this one off for a year, leave Sancho in Dortmund. Is that likely to happen? Or can you see Sancho agitating maybe for a move sooner? Or how do you see the Sancho opera play now? That's really tricky because um, I... I don't know Jaden Sancho. I don't know what's going through his mind. Um, I, if I was advising him, I would tell him to stick around for another year. Um, not only from the sort of player development perspective, but also to sort of raise his stock. I mean, not only monetarily to see him get a bigger payday, to see Dortmund get a bigger payday, but also because I personally think that Sancho is going to be a, you know, Ballon d'Or candidate in the future. He's going to be up there with with Mbappe and Holland and you know the guys who are now either 20, 19, 20, 21, 22 yeah. who are going to rule for the next yeah. decade. Um, and one of the reasons why I wouldn't like to see him, for example, to go to Liverpool at this point, hypothetically, even though I don't yeah. see it happening at all, is because he's a player that needs to go to a team where he's going to be a centerpiece, where he's going yeah. to be basically be first choice every game. You know, Manchester United are at a point right now where they could probably guarantee him that. Yeah, um, <laughs> and a lot of money to build yes, as well. Absolutely. So I, I, I would not be surprised if he was tempted by that offer, or yeah. indeed an offer by you know the likes of of Chelsea or or yeah. a, a team that was a little bit off of of the top 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 in, in the yeah. Premier League. And I think he's a Chelsea um, fan as well, so that might yeah. be an added yeah. um, incentive for him to go there. Yeah, who, now, who, who can who can account for taste? Yeah, well, that's it. You know, there's there's no place in some people, but um, I think Sancho, you are spot on there. It's it's not there's no space at Liverpool for Sancho at the moment, but that could change in a year's time if he was to oh, stick yeah. around. You know, Mo Salah could move on, or Sadio sure. Mane could move on, and that opens up. But I agree with you. There's no there's no hope of Jaden Sancho going to Liverpool to fight for a place with Mo Salah, with Sadio Mane, with Roberto Firmino, with Timo Werner, hopefully, you know. So it, it doesn't make sense, but he still gets linked. And he's a player that I think Klopp really does like and would love to work with, but just the timing I don't think is right. And I think the money that Man United will throw at him could really tempt him whenever the, the transfer window opens. We don't know when that's going to be. And I just think he could make that move too soon. I think I agree. Stay a year at the, at Dortmund. You're playing Champions League football. You're you're a, a superstar and keep developing that. But we'll see what happens. Another player linked with Liverpool now, and I think is actually going to be the Werner replacement at Leipzig is Milo Rashica from Werder Bremen. What do you make of him? Would he be suited to live or not to Liverpool? Sorry, to England even, or is he nailed on for Leipzig? 
Uh, I, I think he is actually nailed on for yeah. Leipzig. I think there's going to be a lot of haggling going on over that fee because, um, you know, <laughs> Werder Bremen's face, whether that means, uh, you know, sticking around in the top flight or, or, or going down, is going to make a big difference in, in what that fee is. Uh, but actually, I think he's a spectacular replacement for Timo Werner. Um, he's, you know, not not quite the same player. I think he actually has a little bit more... Uh, to offer in terms of of technique, I think he's a guy who can actually beat more players off the dribble and um, is a bit trickier than Timo Werner. I don't yeah. think he is quite the finisher that Werner is, but maybe maybe that is something that the future holds. Um, he's he's a really exciting player. I think um, you know, were it not for him, uh, <laughs> Werner would be probably much closer to rock bottom. Uh, and I think that Leipzig would do well uh, to sign him up. And and you know, I, it, for one for the future, maybe for yeah. for Liverpool. Yeah, well, that's that's it. He's getting a lot of traction lately, and I, I'd only been reading that Leipzig look to be the the favourite destination there. But as you say, it could be one to watch in the future. Um, of maybe one two two years down the line, it might be one to look at mm. when the old the older guys need replacing. A final one we'll, we do get linked a lot with, and I think it's another one destined for Bayern Munich is um they are open Meccano against sticking at Leipzig. Is there talk of him moving on? Is it Bayern Munich again for him? Bayern increasing their French defender count. What's the future for Ruben Meccano? <laughs> yeah, it, it looks like it looks like he does want to go to Bayern. Um, yeah, I, I don't blame him. Bayern is actually Bayern's a great pl- place to play, uh, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Um, it's a club that's extremely well run. It's a club that is pretty much in the thick of it for titles every season. Yeah. I mean, you guys at Liverpool have been <laughs> feeling a little spoiled lately, but you know, who knows what the future holds? Uh, we were uh, hard for long enough. I know it. I know it. And, and let's just, <laughs> I know that this pandemic is coming at exactly the wrong time for you as well. Yeah, um, yeah I would have been, that would have been scary if, if yeah. Upa Meccano had ended up uh, with, Liverpool because with that guy next to VVD yeah that is basically a lockdown <laughs> center yeah. back pairing for the next 5 to 10 years it would have been lights out because this guy is serious he has the same sort of quickness smarts big body you know he's he's great and he's going to he be looks a big, the real big deal, deal player yeah. he does look the real deal and i suppose to go to Bayern Munich when you've got Pavard and Hernandez, two big signings that they've made there in the last uh, year as well, also to young French guys, it's probably a good move for him. You know, it's an easy move for him to make. Um, and it's a if it's an area, do you feel it's an area Bayern do need to reshape going forward? Um, I know Boateng is still there, and they've got Sula still only a young guy, isn't he? So, mm-hmm. is would it be a Sula and? Up in Meccano with Pavard and Re and Hernandez are does Hernandez and Pavard not figure as much? I figure that that if if Upa Meccano ends up there, then Sula and Upa Meccano will be the first choice uh, yeah. pairing at center back. Uh, Pavar has been playing; he's been moving around, uh, yeah. at, you know, both in central defense and um, you know as as a winger Louis or wing back, right back yeah. rather. Um, the emergence of Alfonso Davies um, yeah. over the, the, this past season has has really reshaped things. I mean, he showed up at that club expected to be probably a more attacking winger. They have very successfully turned him into uh, a fullback, wingback, depending on you know whatever yeah. uh, formation they're playing. Very and, destructive with the pace he has. Yeah, I mean, in truth, I would not be surprised to see you know Pavar. Depending on what happens with Hernandez, uh, and, and you know he's really just kind of finding his way at Bayern because he spent a fair bit of this season uh, hurt. I, you know, if if Alfonso Davies is is there, sort of, you know, is, he's going to be manning one side and 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 Hernandez is on the other. I, I think Pavar might need to find himself another, yeah. either another position to play or another uh, club to play at because <laughs> I don't see him getting past, um, you know. Upa Meccano and and uh, Suda. I personally yeah. I don't see it. And I know it's strength and depth is a great thing, but there can be uh, an embarrassment of riches as well. And yeah. and players don't want to be the the tour de four taxi on the rank, you know. And where well, there would be games to be had, I think it could be right. And the likes of Pavard might look. And you'd have no no shortage of suitors either. So 
it might be the time for him to move on. He could come to Liverpool. Why not? We'll take it. No problem. No problem. Hey, you, you turned uh, you turned Joel Matip into a top, oh. a top defender, which he never really was in the Bundesliga. Well, you know, it took it took a it took a while to get him there, and he sort of fell into it. And he's he's actually been quite solid, you know. And it's not a description I would have ever heard of Joel Matip before. I was solid defender, you know. He's gangly, quite ungainly looking, but. Over the last year, he's really um, come into his own. I suppose you're playing alongside Virgil van Dijk, and he, he can carry a lot of players along with him. But Matip has really stood stood up and um, become a bit of a leader in the team. You know, it's it's maybe unexpected, but it's a position that Liverpool may look to um, strengthen themselves, and that's why Upa Meccano might have been linked. But then the chances, if Liverpool rate Joe Gomez so highly, the chances of Upa Meccano coming in and sitting behind him were probably low as well so Liverpool might be looking at the next tier down or the tier even below that for the centre back replacement but that's that's some of the players one player that has been linked with Liverpool and you might be able to tell me more about this guy because I know nothing I've just seen the name Malik Tia from Schalke do you know anything about Malik Tia T-H-I-A-W I think he's only a young centre back he may made his debut yeah. this season <laughs> they're, they're, another Joel not- Matip you know, there's, there, there's, we haven't seen enough of him to, to yeah. form a very, uh, a very smart opinion. So I, yeah. I think sit on that one for a while. And I suppose the the David War- David Warner connection with um with Jurgen Klopp mm-hmm. being there, maybe he's getting the inside word that this guy's one for the future. Because another Schalke player that I actually quite like, and I don't know if you're right, but I think he would suit Liverpool's pressing style. Would be Weston McKinney at Schalke. Yeah. Um, his is he a player that has a big future and does he link to any moves away there would you know from the german media or is he quite settled at schalke at the moment oh he is quite settled at schalke at the moment however he did say actually going into this quarantine ahead of uh this this next slate of games this next match day he did say that his long-term goal is to play in england so uh, the interest from his side is definitely there i mean I can certainly tell you as as a Bundesliga fan, you know, an American Bundesliga fan who yeah. now lives in the US, like we're always getting the short end of the stick. Everybody's watching the Premier League. I understand why an American player would want to play in the Premier League. It, it is the it is the league that, it, that that most fans here watch yeah. and he would have a much higher profile if he was there. So, I get it. And I suppose it's one that Liverpool, again, Liverpool so selfish just to relate everything to Liverpool. But we have an issue with Gini Vinaldum at the moment that there's a contract mm. issue. He's got a year to go. So McKinney could be a, an option to come in there next season even. and might be one to watch. So it's one I'd certainly like to see happen myself. But who knows? Are there any other players that you feel would be worth keeping an eye on from a Bundesliga point of view? Uh, I know right, you haven't watched too much of Liverpool, but if known maybe the, the type of player and the type of style that Jurgen Klopp would usually play, is there anyone you feel that we may not be too familiar with over here that might be worth keeping an eye on? Hmm. Um, nah, I mean, uh, basically there, there's a couple of players who I, I think probably aren't ready for the move, but maybe one day will be. Um, I mean, in that... Um, in that Marco Rosa, uh, the the coach of Borussia Mönchengladbach, mm. um, you know, plays a counteracting uh, counterattacking style, which is not all that dissimilar to the kind of style that that Klopp is known for. I think players who fit into that system are probably uh, an okay yeah. fit. I mean, Marcus Turam, uh, the sort of lead striker there. Yeah. Um, I don't think he's quite ready uh, for that kind of a move, but maybe he will be one day. A couple uh, Dennis, of years away. Dennis Zakaria um, as, yeah. as more of a, a midfield player. I think actually when it comes to development, you know, you, you mentioned Weston McKinney already. Yeah. I mean, I think Zakaria is probably a little further along than, yeah. than McKinney. There's actually too. a name that's been linked as well previously to Liverpool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's definitely one to watch, uh, which is interesting. You know, a, a lot of again, you, you, we'd follow a lot of guys on Twitter who would be, you know, in the know and would be watch this, watch that, and they have mentioned Zachary as a future player for Liverpool. So mm-hmm. he's one we'll definitely be keeping an eye on to see how he develops and how he progresses. So it, it's it's good to keep an eye there and Turam as well. Um, we'll we'll watch that one with interest and see see what comes of that. Um, as so you're a Hertha Berlin fan, is that right? Yeah. Yes, 
it's been an interesting ride this season. I would say so. <laughs> and it's, it's one that we actually keep an eye on because we have Marco Grujic parked up mm-hmm. there. Um, how has he got on? I heard that. It's, uh, my own reading of it was he had a good four season on loan. I think Paul Dardoy was a big fan. And then there's been a lot of coaching upheaval there. And he seems to have dropped down the pecking order somewhat. Yeah, really? absolutely. I think you're, you're spot on. Last season, uh, despite the fact that he missed, you know, 10 to 15 games with injury, uh, he was really, really good. He was, yeah. you know, Pal Dardai, the former coach at Hertha, you know, said that he was the best player that Hertha That's had right, had yeah. in, in, a, in a generation. And I thought yeah. he was right. I mean, I've, I've been, a, you know, a Hertha fan pretty actively for, I don't know, about 14 years and yeah. i think he was definitely the best player but that they've had in that stretch um however this season <laughs> has been a Not real so real come down um yeah i i don't blame him because he is uh, a young guy who is used to sort of being at the center of things um you know he started off really well um he you know scored in in the opener against Bayern, yeah. also gave up a penalty, uh, but um, he was he was at the middle of things, and it really felt like Grijic was going to sort of get off to where he he yeah. left off. Everything at Hertha has been crazy. You know, we we had basically a, a blown up youth coach uh, to start off the season. Um, you know, heading things up, replaced him with Jurgen Klinsmann, who I think many of us, especially those who have been fans of the U.S. men's national team. No, is 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 nobody's um, expert coach. Yeah. Um, I Turned hope that would be the case. <laughs> yes, I hope that this new coach that's been brought in, actually during the the pandemic uh, break, yeah. uh, Bruno Labadia, who's really a veteran Bundesliga coach. Yeah. He's nobody's idea of a real innovator, but he is a highly capable coach who has helped a lot of teams get out of relegation scraps and into, you know, European uh, places. He's done it at, at, you know, Hamburg, Stuttgart, yeah. Wolfsburg. He's, he's a good coach. I hope that they will form a good relationship. And, you know, at the very least over these next, you know, set of games, we'll get to see the good, Marco Grujic. I have no idea whether he wants to be at Hertha next season. I have no idea whether Hertha wants him to be there, but yeah. I would like the relationship to continue. And I, I would hope that the next few games will show us that it will be a productive one and that, that he'll do something. Good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it, what a difference a year makes because I think uh, when Grujic had come back to Liverpool in the summer, he was, he was agonizing to go back to Hertha. That's, that was where he wanted to go. He, he really wanted another season back there. But as things change, um, the, you can't really account for, you know, managerial changes, whether one guy likes it, another guy doesn't. And he really has seemingly struggled there. So, it would be quite interesting to see what happens because I think didn't they spent a lot of money in the January window? Piontek mm-hmm. came in and Matthias Cunha, um, mm-hmm. Assasabar. There was a lot of money went on these guys, yeah. was it, to, to strengthen the team? So, it, is it a possibility if Grujic was to get some form back that they may look to make that permanent? Because I don't think there'd be much resistance from Liverpool. Um, to be honest, I think he's a player that that maybe quite easily available but um is it one that you could see maybe happening or has it, it it's gone too far do you think now or i think it ha- it's all a matter of form and a matter of, of valuation yeah. um from everything i had read in the past about how much uh, liverpool had quoted to herta about a permanent move yeah. um it was really too rich for their blood yeah um you know, of course, Hertha's, Hertha's blood has, has, they've gotten a transfusion in, in the yeah. meantime. So I think things have changed in that respect. However, if Liverpool still want, you know, 20, 25 million for this player, um, they would have paid that if this was a year ago and yeah. they had this money then. But, you know, um, unless he, he comes and, and plays like a house on fire, uh, over this next stretch to end this season, there's no way that Hertha would be interested in paying yeah. that kind of money. I mean, but also to the, the fact that one of the other players that they bought, not only did they buy Aska Sibar, who's a you know defensive midfielder, yeah. but they also bought Luca Tussar, who has been sent back on loan to Olympique Lyon. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's going to come in the summer, which yeah. that creates an even bigger position. loan. Yeah. So it's another log jam, isn't it, at that position for him? 
which is a bit of a shame because I think he is a player that's suited to the Bundesliga. I think he's he's gone there. He's physically he's he's big and he's strong, which should suit the Premier League. But I just don't think it's going to really work out for my Liverpool. Now another player that I've seen linked, and I don't know if this is very very sketchy. You might know more. Is Lourdes Carius? Um, Lourdes Carius has had his uh, contract. He cancelled his contract over in Besiktas come back to Liverpool I don't think he has a future in in Liverpool or England and I think it may be a move back to the Bundesliga to rebuild his career would be the way to go now I did see him linked with Berlin and I'm assuming it was Hertha or was it Union it was Hertha yeah it was Hertha is is it something you could see happening is it is it a position that they need to strengthen and do you think is it and without sounding too disrespectful to to Loris Cardius is it too big of a move for them because the, the spotlight, even I feel that the likes of Beshik has really, it's, it's a very intimidating and very passionate place to be, was maybe, you know, my thinking was he'd need a, even a lower level of club. Now, I know Hurt are struggling at the moment, but they're, they're a big club. They're they're not a small team. Would a team out of the limelight have been, maybe be a better move for Cardius to rebuild his career, or do you think he could do it at Hurt? That is a big question. Um, I think just from a strictly like a personnel um, sense, I think it actually kind of makes sense. Um, Hertha are reaching the end of the contract. I think they, they've basically had two goalkeepers, both of whom have, are, are kind of getting up in years, yeah. um, in, in Thomas Kraft and Rune Arstein, um, who have been sort of one and two for them for the last four or five years. Um, it looks like um, Kraft is going to be moving on probably to a goalkeeping coaching position. Yeah. Uh, Rudy Jarstein, um, I think, has one more year on his contract, but his status as the absolute number one is not what it once was. So in a lot of ways, bringing on a new guy who expects to be number one or at least fight for it uh, would make a lot of sense. I'm not super convinced that that is that Loris Karius is that guy. I mean, if, if you had asked me prior to his debacle, uh, in the Champions League final, it, it would have been a dream to have him uh, in, in between the sticks at Hertha. I think he's, you know, what he did in Germany and, and what he did get, getting started in Liverpool, um, you know, he built up a really nice resume for himself. Yeah, Berlin is a tough place to play, though, for that yeah. reason that despite the fact it's not a club that is terribly successful or decorated or whatever, the media there is huge. Um, I mean, there's you know, five or six daily newspapers in uh, Berlin. There's a lot of national media attention uh, there, which for a player who is trying to sort of be an Instagram star <laughs> probably is a little bit attractive. It's, and it's a nice place to align yourself with brands and stuff. Uh, if, if you're a player, however, who, who wants to be left alone for a little while, which maybe he does, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe going to a place, you know, going to play back at Mites or going to play at Augsburg or going to play uh, for a big second division club like like Stuttgart or Hamburg. Maybe that's a better move. But I could see it happening, actually. Yeah, because he's still quite young. So, yeah. you know, I suppose if, if he wants and you, you touched on it, there, you hit the nail on the head and it's a criticism that he got from Liverpool fans when he was with us. He did seem like a, a male model who played a bit of football on the side. You know, he's, sure. yeah. he's very, very strong on the Instagram <laughs> game. You don't hate him because he's beautiful. No, that's, <laughs> it's something that, um, you know, a man with a head of hair like that, I could, I could only admire him. But um, it, it's one, it's a criticism that you got unfairly. And I agree, when, when Liverpool signed him, I was quite excited. I thought it was a coup to get a guy from Mainz. I think he'd been behind Neuer, probably the best keeper in Germany that year. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a four and a half million or so. It was a small fee, relatively, and it was it looked like a coup. And then he got in, and just to have that happen to him in the biggest stage of all was just catastrophic. And then he came back to preseason, and he was making errors against Tranmere and yep. you know really small teams. And I think the fear was that he needed to go somewhere and get the head down and concentrate. Now, maybe Istanbul probably wasn't the best place to do that. The same way Berlin might not be the best place to do that. So I agree, maybe a, a smaller, get the head down, rebuild the career might be the way forward. Um, so from Hertha's point of view, how do you see the rest of the season going? They're a few points off 
well off the relegation zone but they're flirting with the bottom of the table is is it looking up was was it looking up before the break or where they fall and what was the, the form before the break um Hertha was looking like they were just going to squeak staying in the league yeah. um a lot of that had to do with the situation that it had, had happened with with Klinsmann leaving extremely abruptly. Yeah. They're deciding not to make another coaching move during the middle of the season, but instead to keep Klinsmann's number two just to sort of keep the yeah. keep the seat warm, which was not a decision that was very popular, but seemed prudent to some people. Um, I think there is a very good chance that the remainder of the season will go very well for them. Yeah. Um, I, I not necessarily because I. I I think that um, you know the stars are aligning in any way, but I think to a great yeah. degree, um, this is a club or, or or a squad. Let's just say that is actually pretty good. That has yeah. a, a good deal of talent. That you know, you know, not just me because I'm a Hertha fan, but a lot of people uh, thought we're going to be, you know, in that sort of six to 10 range in, in the league that, you know, if things went right for them, they could maybe squeak into the Europa league. Yeah. But if things didn't go right for them, the worst they do is mid table. Yeah. The talent is there and it got better over, over yeah. the winter break. I mean, Cunha and Piontek look like they're good players. Yeah. And unfortunately <laughs> there has just been one case of coaching malpractice after another. Yeah. I mean, basically the guys who have been coaching this team this whole season, are not up to it. And now we have a real coach. Um, so I think that there is a lot of reason to believe that this team will be significantly better um, under a real coach. I, I don't know what that's going to earn them. I think they're, you know, barring an absolute um, <laughs> tear yeah. that they go on, they're, yeah. they're not going to get anything out of this season. Um, but I think that, that they should probably be able to get themselves to safety um, quickly enough. Excellent. Well, hopefully they do. Like I said, it's a big club. It's it's one you want to see doing well, and and you know I hope they can they can get out of the trouble that they're in. As you say, a bit of stability is what's needed because they do have the players there, and if they can get the likes of Piontek playing how he did at Genoa, was it Genoa? He was a yeah, yeah, Genoa. If they get him playing in his early days at Milan, then they do have a really good striker on their hands, and look, and anyway, we all know. If you have someone that can score goals, it can get you out of a lot of trouble. So I think if they can get that going, I think it might be what they need. So hopefully they stay up. Listen, Matt, I won't take up to you any more of your time. I'd just like to thank you for coming on and having this chat with us. And um, again, I'd like to just uh, any of our listeners out there take it on and follow the Talking Foosball podcast. It, it's a really good really good outlet like i said for bundesliga news um and i really enjoy it myself so look thanks very much matt thanks for for joining us for this nice i enjoyed it very much thanks uh thanks for having me on no problem at all listen thank you very much and we'll leave it there thank you very much folks